So today's speaker is Jarek Kobinski, and he will give his third lecture on applications of tractor calculus in general relativity. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Uh, before I continue, let me recall what I did on the previous lecture. So I was working in the setting of asymptotically the Sitter space times. So the space time satisfying Einstein field equations one with positive cosmological constant lambda where this non-negative constant Q can be thought of as a decay rate of the matter fields as we approach conformal infinity. So uh, in the setting of asymptotically the Sitter space times, I characterize the geometry of conformal infinity in four dimensions in terms of constraints relating conformal fundamental forms and the stress energy tensor density tau. Uh, so in four dimensions, those constraints uh, uh included trace free extrinsic curvature a projected part of the vial tensor with two normal vectors hooked into it hypersurface divergence of the cotton projected cotton tensor and the projected part of the Bach tensor so today i want to focus on a different class of space times which are space times with initial isotropic singularity and before i talk about a uh, definition of general space time of this type let me go through an example which indicates, which highlights the main features of this, this space times with uh, isotropic singularities. So in this example, I want to solve uh, four-dimensional Einstein field equations with vanishing cosmological constant. That's equation three. And I want to assume that the metric G tilde has the form visible in four. So we see that the metric is fully determined except for one scalar function A, which is just a function of one coordinate t. As for the stress energy tensor, I'm assuming that it has a perfect fluid form visible in five, where we have two additional functions, rho, which is the fluid's density, and p, which is its pressure, both functions of only of time t. And v is a one form corresponding to the fluid's four velocity. And I'm assuming that this four velocity, four velocity is just partial t. Now, one more thing which is needed to solve the, the Einstein field equation is the equation of state for the, the stress energy tensor. So in this example, equation of state for the perfect fluid. And in, this con in the context of this example, the equation of state can be formulated as a relation between uh, the two scalar functions, rho and p, uh, characterizing the fluid, and that this equation is visible in six. So because I want to have a physically realistic stress energy tensor, this constant W is restricted to be minus one over three uh, uh, and one. Okay, so now <clears throat> I can take my assumption about the metric from four, about the stress energy tensor from five, used, and use the equation of state, plug everything into Einstein field equations and solve, solve them explicitly. And the solution is visible here in seven. So we see that function A from, from the metric is just proportional to T to some positive power, which depends on W, and that the fluid, uh, fluid's density rho is constant over T squared. So I chose the initial conditions in a way uh, that A is zero on T equals zero hypersurface. Uh, okay, so now we can plug in seven into the metric and uh, this tensor will, have, will now have a form visible in eight. And in order to make a connection between definition of general space times with isotropic singularities, I want, I'm introducing a new time coordinate tau, which is defined by relation nine. So if this new coordinate, the metric can be written as visible in 10. So it's explicitly conformally flat now. And this conformal, fac conformal factor can be written in a form uh, omega to some power alpha, where alpha uh, is positive here because it's just four over three W plus one. So uh, yeah, so it's positive unless W is not equal to minus one over three, but that's a boundary case that I'm not really not gonna discuss here. Uh, so we, by looking at 10, we see that because alpha is positive uh, that uh, and the, the, the conformal factor omega is just proportional to, to tau, then we have uh, we have um, a hypersurface which can be called an initial isotropic uh, singularity hypersurface which which corresponds to uh, 
to the, to the hypersurface when the conformal factor omega is zero, which means in, in this example that uh, initial isotropic singularity hypersurface is located at tau equals to zero. Uh, okay, so now uh, before I go to the definition of general generic space time of this type, let me just say that this everything that I'm gonna sorry I have to say right now is a topic of a joint project with Rod Gover and Henry Waldron, and the paper should appear soon on archive. Okay, so the initial isotropic singularity space time or isotropic singularity space time for short. Is an n dimensional space time m tilde with a metric g tilde that arises as follows. So we have a smooth manifold m, which can be thought of as the conformal extension of m tilde. So m is equipped with smooth conformal structure of Lorentzian signature, a space like boundary sigma, and a weight u defining scale tau with negative u, that is a defining density of, a, of our space like boundary meaning that tau is zero on sigma and it has a non-zero gradient there. So now the <clears throat> this manifold M tilde can be thought of as the interior of, of M and without loss of generality can also be thought as a region where the scale tau is positive and a space-time metric G tilde can be defined as tau to alpha times the conformal metric where alpha is minus two over U so we see that because I assume that u is negative, alpha is positive. So we have us initial. Uh, so we have an initial uh, isotropic singularity hypersurface, uh, and that's hypersurface. That's that's sigma, because the the physical metric g tilde is degenerate on this hypersurface. So now <clears throat> I want to study geometry of. Uh, initial isotropic singularity in terms of conformal fundamental forms, but before I do it, I need to write, write the Einstein field equations in a conformally covariant way, similarly to what I did uh, on my last lecture in the context of asymptotically the Sitter space times. So, uh, yeah, so the obviously since uh, M tilde and G tilde is a space time, then the, the metric satisfies Einstein field equations visible here in 12 with some stress energy tensor T tilde and a cosmological constant lambda. So to write 12 in a conformally covariant way, I'm splitting it into trace free and trace parts. And that's, that's equations 13, where in the first equation, I already replaced trace free uh, part of the Ricci tensor by, by trace free part of the skeleton tensor. So now I also want to introduce stress energy tensor density He, which will be a section of a bundle of symmetric two tensors of weight V, where V is to be determined. And my, my stress energy tensor density can be defined with the use of relation corresponding to the space-time metric G tilde. Okay, so uh, what I can what can be non, done now is I can look at the trace free part of the Einstein field equation. So the first equation from 13, I can plug in this, my stress energy tensor density to the right hand side and write the trace free part of the Scouten tensor in terms of almost Einstein operator acting on a weight one scale sigma. And the result is visible here in 16. But if you recall in the definition of space time with initial isotropic singularity, uh, there was a uh, there was a scale weight used scale tau, which which was used to, to in the definition of the space time metric. And now we have some sig weight one scale sigma tilde. So I can now introduce the scale uh, tau from the definition of, of the space time as a sigma tilde to to power u such that uh, we, we recover the, the definition of the space-time metric uh, in a form that the G tilde is tau to minus two over U times the conformal metric as in 70. So now if we <clears throat> plug in a relation between sigma tilde and tau in 16, then this equation uh, becomes equation 18. And if you look at the left-hand side of this equation, we see that it's uh, it, it's regular everywhere, so it goes perfect, perfectly fine to the boundary sigma. 
so if we want the right hand side to also be regular everywhere, this fixes the weight of the stress energy tensor density to be 2u as in 90. So now the stress energy tensor density is a se section of a bundle of symmetric two tensors of weight 2u. So ultimately, using this fact, we can write down the trace free part of the Einstein field equations in a form visible in 20. Okay, now as for the trace part uh, of Einstein field equations, which is written here again in 21, uh, you, we can write it in a conformally covariant way if we use a uh, if we recall the fact that there was a relation between scalar curvature and uh, the norm of, of some scale tractor. Uh, so if we use this fact, then 21 can be written in, a, in an equivalent way visible in 22, where on the left-hand side we have norm of scale tractor corresponding to our defining density tau. And on the right-hand side, we have some amount of a trace energy tensor uh, trace of the stress energy tensor density he and cosmological constant lambda. Now there is a potential problem if the denominator in 22 is zero, which means that when u has weight one minus n over two, because I'm excluding a case when of one and two dimensional space times, but that's actually not a problem because if u has this special value, then we can go back to 21 and again, try to write the scalar curvature as some sort of operator acting on our defining density tau. And if we do it, then this, the 21 will, will just become equation 24. So by inspecting 24, we see that the light left-hand side is zero on the, on, the, on, the, on the initial isotropic singularity. So this means that the trace of the stress energy tensor density also, be, also needs to be zero there. Okay, but that was only a special case generically. So when U doesn't have this value and one minus N over two, the trace part of the Einstein field equations is 25. And <clears throat> this equation implies that the extension of the normal vector, which can be defined, denoted here by N and can, which can be defined as grad tau, has a norm which depends on uh, has a norm on the boundary which depends on the trace of stress energy tensor as visible in 26. So there are two important consequences of this equation. The first consequence is that unlike in the case of asymptotically the sitter space times, the cosmological constant now that doesn't play any role in in determining the causal character of the boundary. Because then the norm of the this uh, normal vector does not depend on cosmological constant, but it depends on the trace of the stress energy tensor density now. So the second consequence uh, is that if we want to work in the setting of space times with initial isotropic singularities and not have any matter fields, then the boundary, you can only have a boundary which is a null hypersurface. Because if we don't have any matter fields, then obviously the trace of stress energy tensor density is zero. So the first term on the right hand side of 26 is zero, meaning that the normal vector has zero length on, on, on sigma. So it's a null hypersurface. Okay, so to summarize, uh, what I discussed here now is <clears throat> I started from the Einstein field equations and I uh, write them in an equivalent conformally covariant way. And what I obtained is another version of a Nabla I equation that's the co which corresponds to the trace free part of the Einstein field equations, and that's equation 28. And, an, and a kind of I squared equation corresponding to the trace part of the Einstein field equations visible in 29. So now uh, I can use uh, those equations to, to talk about conformal fundamental forms of sigma. But before I do it, let me uh, talk about a very simple but very uh, interesting theorem, which, which is a consequence, which can be obtained basically just by looking at 28 and 29. And this theorem is as follows. So. Apart from uh, induced conformal metric on our initial singularity hypersurface sigma, 
there is also an, an induced canonical Riemannian metric on this hypersurface. And I will denote this metric by G sigma. And the proof of this theorem is very simple. So we can look at the norm of Grad tau squared. Uh, because sigma is a space like hypersurface, then this norm is less, is, uh, less than zero. But we also know that because tau has weight u, then this norm has weight two times u minus one. And because of the assumption that u is less than zero, this weight is, def is never zero. So we can actually use it to construct a metric g tau in the neighborhood of the uh, initial isotropic singular uh, hypersurface as visible in 30. And now decree that the metric, the canonical Riemannian metric induced on this hypersurface is just restriction of g tau to the tangent space of sigma. Uh, there's also a corollary uh, uh, here. So if this corollary says that if sigma is a closed hypersurface, then there is also a canonical volume attached to it. And this volume can be uh, can be just computed by integrating the volume element corresponding to the met canonical Riemannian metric G sigma over the hypersurface as visible in 31. <coughs> okay, so now moving towards conformal fundamental forms. So if we recall the basic object in the construction of conformal fundamental forms was the extension of the trace free part of extrinsic curvature which could be obtained from extracting a tensorial slot from a nabla i tractor. And in the setting of uh, space times with initial isotropic singularities, a similar object can be defined, uh, which will be denoted, denoted here by e tau. So the way to get to define this e tau is I want to take uh, my nabla i of a pro of an appropriate scale tractor, so the scale tractor corresponding to tau to one over u scale, then extract the middle slot from the tractor, middle middle slot meaning tensorial slot, and then multiply by, by an appropriate power of tau such that this whole expression is regular everywhere, and that's the right hand side of thirty two. Now, in 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 terms of tensorial expressions. You can look at uh, an explicit form of this nabla i tractor from 32. Uh, and and if, we, if you do it and then extract the middle slot multiplied by this power of tau, then the tensorial expression of e tau is just given in, in, in the right hand side of 33. But now what we can do is we can go back to the trace free part of the Einstein field equations and actually see that this whole expression on the right hand side of 33 actually equals a uh, trace free part of the stress energy tensor density divided by n minus two, and that's equation 34. So now I can use this equation, equation 34, to derive constraints relating the conformal fundamental forms and the stress energy tensor density on the, the boundary sigma. But before I do it, before I even start talking about uh, applying definitions of conformal fundamental forms here, there's one more step that needs to be done. So if you go, if you look at the right hand side of 33, you'll see that it's written only in terms of tau and its derivatives. But uh, if you recall, I, 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 I talked about that the, the grad tau is def definitely cannot be thought of as extension of the unit normal vector because its norm on the boundary is proportional to the trace of the stress energy tensor density. So in order to <clears throat> look at 34 and apply uh, apply the definition of conformal fundamental forms here, we need some a notion of the extension of the unit normal vector. But fortunately, uh, if you recall, so, so we have a hypersurface sigma here. And I, I mentioned in the previous lecture that if we have a hypersurface, then there is a canonical singular Yamabe scale attached to any hypersurface. And this canonical singular Yamabe scale is a defining density of the boundary. So it's zero, uh, it's zero on sigma and not with non-zero gradient there. And correct can be characterized by the condition that I squared of sigma is minus one plus some terms of order n as in 36. So now I can use my canonical singular Yamabe scale uh, 
to, the, to define the extension of the unit normal vector n hat, uh, and which can be de defined, defined now as just as grad sigma. And because of the I sigma squared equation, uh, uh, we can see that the norm of n hat is now minus one plus some linear terms in sigma as in 37. So this, this grad sigma is now uh, uh, gives us a good notion of the extension of the unit normal vector as opposed to the extension of the normal vector, which, uh, which can be read off from grad tau. Okay, but now uh, with the sigma and tau in town, we have two defining density of our, of our, of our boundary, also of our initial uh, isotropic singularity hypersurface. So I need to introduce third scale of weight one minus u denoted here by kappa, which serves as a way to make a transition between tau and sigma, and that's equation thirty nine. So, <clears throat> so now with those three scales, I can now go back to my formula, my expression of e tau, replace every instance of kappa by sigma by every instance of tau by sigma over kappa. And what I'll get is I'll get an expression visible on the right-hand side of 40. Uh, so if we look at the second term in this, in this expression, we see that this, this term has precisely what we need because it contains the extension of the trace-free part of the extrinsic curvature nabla and hat. But the problem is that it's not a leading term because this guy is multiplied by sigma. So the first step, the first step which needs to be done is we need to remove the sigma from this extension of the trace free part of extrinsic curvature. But this can be done pretty easily with the use of the operator delta that I talked about uh, on the last lecture, which can be thought of as a conformally covariant uh, uh, way to write uh, to, of taking a derivative in the uh, normal di direction n hat. So if we apply this operator to our e tau, then the leading term will just be proportional to the to the to this extension of the trace free part of extrinsic curvature delta uh, nabla and hat. And that's the first term uh, on the right hand side of forty one. So now with this object at hand, with the this tensorial object delta e tau, we can uh, finally talk about uh, using the definition of conformal fundamental forms. And if we do it, then uh, we can say that the I plus two conformal fundamental form can be defined as trace free projected part of delta I applied to our delta e tau object. And that's the right hand side of 42. But now we can recall that there was a relation between e tau and the trace free part of stress energy tensor that's uh, visible here again in equation 43. So we can use this relation to, to write down a general equation uh, uh, which, which, said, which gives us a constraint between, constraints between conformal fundamental forms and the stress energy tensor on the boundary, and that's equation 44. So we see that um, the form of constraints will be that I plus two conformal fundamental form of the boundary, uh, equals one over n minus two times this operator applied to the stress energy tensor density. Now, unfortunately, I cannot give you an explicit example of this, the constraint 44. So example for some specific eyes because we still haven't finished this part, but we're expecting to again obtain some constraints relating trace free part of extrinsic curvature, some projected part of the vial tensor with two normal vectors. Uh, maybe some divergence of the co projected cotton tensor and the Bach tensor. Okay, so before I uh, before I move to the next part of the lectures, let me just say about <clears throat> tell you something about one more important thing here. So just to recall, this the metric of uh, isotropic singularity space time was defined with the use of this uh, weight u tau scale. Uh, as in 45, where tau is a was a defined is a defining density of the boundary sigma. But I also said that we have a canonical singular Yamabe scale attached to sigma, and that's which can be characterized by conditions 46. So I had to introduce a third scale kappa of weight one minus u, 
which is defined uh, with the use of relation 47. So actually, um, since sigma is a canonical singular Yamabe scale, we can view the geometry of uh, space, isotropic singularity space times as coming uh, entirely by choosing scale kappa and the conformal metric G. Because if we make this choice, the choice of kappa and the conformal metric G, then we can uh, compute scale tau from sigma and kappa using 47. And then from tau, we can compute the space-time metric G tilde using 45. But since we, we can compute the metric, we can then use Einstein field equations to compute the stress energy tensor density or just the stress energy tensor T tau, uh, like, like, uh, like as visible in 48. So what we actually have here is we have a space-time uh, so this class of space times can be viewed as uh, uh, as a space time where the stress energy tensor comes entirely from geometry. By and by geometry, I mean the the choice of kappa and the conformal metric. Uh, but if that is the case, then we need some kind of condition to distinguish between physically admissible and non admissible stress energy tensors. And fortunately, fortunately, we have such conditions, and they are called energy conditions. Uh, so they are they are ad hoc conditions which can be thought of as generalizations of the statement that the energy density of a region of space time can be negative. So the most popular conditions are now weak, dominant, and strong energy conditions visible here, and every condition is formulated in terms of some inequality relating specific parts of the stress energy tensor. So in the end, if we want, if we want to view the space-time with isotropic singularity space-time as a space-time where, where stress energy tensor is determined by geometry, then what we need to do is we need to look at those energy conditions and try to restrict our possible choices of the geometry. So the possible choices of the scale kappa and the conformal metric. Okay, so that's everything that I wanted to say in this part. Uh, so what I want to do now is I want to take everything that I said about conformal fundamental forms of asymptotically the Sitter space times and of space times with initial isotropic singularity and apply it in the uh, in the description of matching procedure in the conformal cyclic cosmology scenario. So let me uh, tell you first what a conformal cyclic cosmology is. So the conformal cyclic cosmology or, or CCC is a model introduced by Roger Penrose, which is main, mostly based on two observations about our universe. So the first observation is that the, our universe started with a big bang. And the second is that the observational value of cosmological constant lambda is positive. So you have two observations, and now we can formulate two implications of those observations. So first of all, if our universe started with a big bang, then the initial state uh, can in its initial state can be modeled by the isotropic singularity space time. And secondly, if cosmological constant is positive, then the end state of the evolution of the universe can be modeled by the asymptotically the Sitter space time. So if we believe those observations, and of, of course, if we believe the implications, then we can view the conformal extension of the space-time uh, corresponding to, any, to our universe in a following way. So we have some manifold M with a conformal uh, class, uh, with a conformal metric G, and the M has a boundary consisting of uh, two hypersurfaces, sigma one and sigma two. So the first the hypersurface sigma one corresponds to the initial state of, of the universe. So it's a uh, uh, can be thought of as the initial uh, isotropic singularity hypersurface, and uh, the other part of the boundary sigma two corresponds to the end state of the evolution of the universe. So can be thought of as corresponding to the conformal boundary of asymptotically the Sitter space time. Now, of course, uh, there is some physical or space-time or physical metric denoted here by G hat, which lives in the interior of this conformal extension M and satisfies some Einstein field equations 50 with stress energy tensor T hat. Uh, 
but because uh, what I said uh, a minute ago, we knew we know something something more about the metric, because we know that <clears throat> there exists scale tau of weight u, which is a defining density of sigma one, and that in the tubular neighborhood of this hypersurface, the metric and the stress energy tensor uh, have have a form visible in fifty one. Which is just to say that in this neighborhood, the, the space time uh, can be modeled by the space time with initial isotropic singularity. Now, we also know that there is a weight one scale sigma, which is a defining density of sigma two. And in a tubular neighborhood of sigma two, the space time metric and the stress energy tensor can be written as, as visible in 52. Meaning that in in this neighborhood, the space time space time can be modeled by asymptotically the Sitter space time. Okay, so uh, what can be done now is we can try to construct a very simple model, which can be called conformal periodic cosmology. So in this model, you look at this conformal extension of our universe and. What you want to do is you want to try to identify the, 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 high, the hypersurface sigma one and sigma two together by, by gluing them together and treating them as a single hypersurface. If you do it, then you'll get a universe which is periodic in time, as the name suggests. So we have a universe where, uh, where time goes in a loop and every event happens infinitely many number of times. But that's this, the conformal periodic cosmology is definitely not the model that Penrose suggested because he suggested conformal cyclic cosmology. So what he did is he imagined that there is a second space time, uh, which I'll denote by M check with the metric G check with its own conformal extension M prime, which has an con conformal metric G prime. And this new space time has the same properties as, as the conform as our universe or its conformal extension, meaning that this con the conformal extension M prime has a boundary consisting of uh, two hypersurfaces, sigma one prime and sigma two. And in the neighborhood of sigma one prime, this, this new space time is again modeled by the space time with initial isotropic singularity. And in the neighborhood of sigma two prime, we have uh, it's modeled by the asymptotic the Sitter space time. So the first step in, in constructing the conformal cyclic cosmology model is now you want to take the, <clears throat> the hypersurface, which corresponds to the end state of the evolution of our universe, sigma two, and try to glue it together with the initial state of this next universe. So the hypersurface sigma one prime. If you do it, then you can imagine a next next you next space time with its own conformal extension of the same type and try to glue together the end state of the glue together sigma two prime with the initial state of the next universe. And the same goes uh, goes for go, goes uh, for for identifying uh, initial state of our universe with some end state of yet another. Uh, space time with its own conformal extension. And if you do this gluing procedure, so if you glue together every conformal boundary of one space time with the conformal boundary of the next space time, then what you'll do is you'll create a cycle, an infinite cycles of universes when where one universe comes after the other. And that's conformal cyclic cosmology model in a nutshell. But what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to focus on, on gluing together two hypersurfaces. So we have a picture where we have our universe, which is called in the setting current eon with the initial state of the next universe or next eon, as Penrose likes, likes to call them. And uh, I'm going to discuss uh, matching. Uh, I'm going to discuss some, instead of just showing pictures, I'm, I'm just I'm going to discuss some aspects of this matching uh, by reviewing part of, parts of the, the paper by Paul Todd, which appears several years ago. OK, so uh, as I said, uh, I'm just, I just want to focus on matching of two space times. So what, well, what I have here is I have three manifolds with metrics. I have this manifold corresponding to our universe, so the current eon, 
the manifold M hat with a metric G hat. Uh, the the ne next eon, so manifold M check with a metric G check. And a conformal extension of both of those eons in the form of the manifold M with a metric G. Now, uh, what I also have is I have two conformal factors, omega hat and omega check, and the space times metric G hat and G check can be obtained from those conformal factors and metric G, which is called here the bridging metric, as visible in 53. And obviously, because M is a, con is a conformal extension of both manifolds, then M is a sum of M hat, M check, and sigma, where sigma, is, uh, sigma corresponds to the end state of the evolution of M hat and the in initial state of, G, of M check. But now, since we already performed the matching, is, uh, sigma is just a, a hypersurface in the conformal extension M. Uh, but because, yeah, but but because on on one on one side of sigma we have asymptotically the Sitter space time, and on the other hand we have space time with initial isotropic singularity, the sigma is also a zero level set of um, of the conformal factor omega check and a zero level set of conformal factor of one over conformal factor omega hat. So indeed we see that because. Uh, omega check is zero on this hypersurface. The metric G check is uh, is a metric of initial isotropic singularity because it degenerates on on sigma, and because one over omega hat is zero on, on sigma, then the metric G hat is a metric of asymptotically the Sitter space time because it's singular on this hypersurface. Okay, so now <clears throat> there is a certain conformal freedom here, meaning that if we rescale both conformal factors uh, by some positive function and, and uh, rescale the bridging metric by, this, by, by the inverse of this, uh, by, by the same function, we'll get the same, uh, we'll get the same space times metric G hat and G check. And this freedom can be used to impose a so-called reciprocal hypothesis, which is just the assumption that the product of two conformal factors omega hat and omega check is minus one, as visible in 56. So now if we, if we assume this hypothesis, then uh, using some simple computation, we can, <clears throat> we can see that the metric in the next eon G check is fully determined by the metric uh, from the, from the, of the current eon G hat, uh, given that we can prescribe a uh, conformal factor omega hat in some unique way. And that's equation 57, which comes directly from some simple manipulations visible in equation 55. Now, you might feel uncomfortable by looking at equation 57 because we have two metrics in this equation, and uh, we, are, we know that the region in which the metric G check is defined is definitely not the same. So in the region where the metric G check is defined, the metric G hat is definitely not defined because G hat is only defined up to the conformal boundary sigma and, and G check is defined on the, say, the other side of this hypersurface in the conformal extension M. But <clears throat> equation 57 can be viewed in an equivalent way. So if we assume that we know the metric from the current eon G hat and we know the conformal factor omega hat, then we can uh, use this knowledge to compute the bridging metric using equation 58. But now if we know the bridging metric and we assume that the, this reciprocal hypothesis 56 holds, then the metric in the next eon G check can be computed from omega from the conformal factor omega hat and the bridging metric 59. So 59 is actually equivalent to 57, but, uh, but now we have uh, uh, everything is fine because the bridging metric is defined everywhere. The conformal factor omega hat is defined everywhere. So we can use this to compute the metric in the next eon. But in the end, what this equation, what 57 and 58, 59 is telling us is that if we, if we assume this reciprocal hypothesis, then uh, 
then the metric in the next eon is fully determined by by the conformal factor and the metric from the, uh, the, the current eon g hat now to see how this works in practice let me go back to my example that i started with so here um, i'm working in four dimensions and i'm assuming that the metric in the current universe or current eon has a very simple for conformally flat form visible in 60 where where the conformal factor is a function a hat and i want to solve the einstein field uh, i want to look at the einstein field equations for the metric 60 with the uh, stress energy tensor of a perfect fluid with radiation equation of state meaning that the pressure of this fluid p hat is just one over three times its density so if you assume it then the einstein field equations in this case reduce to the equation that uh, density of the fluid is just some constant m hat divided over a to four power four and the uh, first order nonlinear ode for this function a hat visible in 61. Now, if you recall the assumption about the relation between the, the physical metric and the bridging metric uh, was as visible in 62. So in this example, the obvious choice for the conformal factor omega hat is that it's proportional to the function A uh, other than 63. So now assuming the reciprocal hypothesis, we can now fully determine the metric in the next EMG check from the from by knowing the conformal factor omega hat and the metric in the, the current EMG hat. So in the end, this metric in the next eon will have a form uh, visible in the second line of 64, where now the, the, conf the conformal factor A check is, check is fully determined by A hat as visible in 65. Uh, so now if we assume that the, this constant C1 is just a quotient of a cosmological constant from the current eon and the, the constant M hat, which appeared in the relation between the fluids density and the, and the conformal factor A hat to some appropriate power visible on the right hand side of 66. Then the Einstein field equations uh, for the metric G check from 64 four will just reduce to the again to the nonlinear first order uh, ODE for the conformal factor A check visible in 67. But now we can compare this, the first order ODE visible here with the first order ODE for the <clears throat> conformal factor corresponding to the current eon, so the equation 61, to see that th those are exactly the same ODEs, where, where, but now instead of hats on every quantity, we have a check on every quantity. So this means that we, st we started from a, from a current eon with some stress energy tensor with the of the perfect fluid form and using reciprocal hypothesis and some clever choosing uh, of a constant we ended up with a next eon which has uh, which is described by space time of the precisely the same same type so we have a, again perfect fluid space time with the radiation uh, equation of state meaning that the two eons are diffeomorphic to each other Okay, but now going back to a general scenario. So, uh, so what I what I want to do here is I want to uh, start from two space time. So I have asymptotically the sitter space time m hat with a metric g hat. So the metric in the neighborhood uh, of the conformal infinity and the stress energy tensor has the form visible in sixty eight. I have another space time with its conformal extension and the conformal boundary sigma one prime. And uh, I want to have I want the space time to be modeled by the space time of initial isotropic singularity in the neighborhood of sigma one prime. And the two questions that can be asked now uh, asked now are when when can I identify those two hypersurfaces? So when 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 can I take the end state of the evolution of one universe and identify it with the initial state of the of the next universe or and the alternative question is what are the matching conditions that allowed me uh, to, to do it 
Now, in order to answer those two questions, I'm not gonna uh, go to a seemingly unrelated, another very interesting problem in general relativity, which in the end will provide me a way to answer the questions about the magic in conformal cyclic cosmology. So this problem is the problem of constructing a simplest model of a spherically symmetric star in GR, meaning that I want to find a solution of the Einstein field equations, which describe a spherical cluster of matter in an empty space time. So if we look closely at, at the thing that we want to construct, we see that we, we have a space time with two uh with with two two different uh sections we have the interior which is described by the homogeneous and isotropic distribution of matter because that's our interior of a star of this, this simplest star simplest simple very simple star that you want to do here and the exterior region which is just vacuum but we know that there are solutions of the Einstein, there are very simple solutions of the Einstein field equations, which describe both homogeneous and isotropic distributions of matter and vacuum. So the, the so the, the, those space times are just perfect fluid space time and Schwarzschild space times, space time, and the metric of those two space times are visible uh, in seventy and seventy one. So what I want to do to construct my simplest model of a spherically symmetric star is I want to take those two metrics from 70 and 71 and try to match them together uh, on, on some hypersurface, which can be thought of as a boundary of this star. Now, because I want to make my life easier, I'm just gonna uh, identify the coordinate T from 70 and T prime from 71, and I'm gonna try to do this matching on t equal constant hypersurface, meaning that I have, a, I have two three-dimensional metrics, g bar interior, g bar exterior, uh, visible in 72. And I want to match them together on some r equal uh, r1 surface and r prime equals r2 surface to create uh, my model of a star where obviously I want R2 to be greater than 2M because I want to do this matching outside of the event horizon of a Schwarzschild black hole. Now, as it turns out, <clears throat> the, the proper matching conditions here are the conditions that the induced metrics on those surfaces and, in the, and the extrinsic curvatures have to be the same, meaning that we look at the interior metric of, uh, and, and consider an induced metric on R equals R1 surface. And that this needs to be the same as the induced exterior metric on R prime equals R2 surface. And the same goes for extrinsic curvatures. That's as visible in equation 74. So if we if I do this matching, so if I match the metrics and extrinsic curvatures, this will give me some conditions relating R2, R1, and the uh, M, which was the con mass constant from the Schwarzschild metric, but as visible in 75, but they are not th that really important here. What's important is that the matching conditions here are precisely the conditions that the first and second fundamental forms needs to be the same. So now going to the model of CCC, I, I dec decree that the matching conditions uh, in the CCC are as follows. So if you want to match asymptotically the Sitter space-time with space-time of initial isotropic singularity, generic, uh, generic general uh, asymptotically the Sitter space-time and general space-time of initial isotropic singularity, what you want to do is you want to match uh, induced conformal metrics on the, con on the conformal boundaries and, and conformal ex, uh, conformal fundamental forms induced on those boundaries. So one question is that how many conformal fundamental forms do you want to match in this this procedure of matching of CC, in the CCC model? And we have some answer uh, to this question, but I'm which I don't don't want to go into details. Let me just say that we think that. If you want to do the matching in the CCC, then you want to match the induced conformal metric and every conformal fundamental form up to the end one. 
And obviously, because <clears throat> you're matching conformal fundamental forms and conformal fundamental forms were related with the stress energy tensors, what you have here is, uh, is, is that if you want to match two space times in the CCC model, then there are some compatibility conditions uh, regarding the two stress energy tensors that, that needs to be satisfied if you want to uh, if you want to identify two conformal boundaries together. Okay, that's everything I wanted to say. Thank you for your attention. And thank you for your talk, for your nice lectures. So are there questions, comments? Uh, yeah, questions. So uh, when, when it is uh, matching coach, um, Perfect fluid with vacuum, the right uh, uh, previous slide. Yes. Uh, your metric, uh, how smooth uh, the, res the resulting metric is? Uh, Find its smoothness or? or... Yeah, Only the secondary values. Only secondary Yeah, values. so yes, C2. So, so you, you, you can't actually do it if you would like, uh, uh, yeah. So, 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 how satisfactory is it actually from from physical perspective that it's not smooth? Uh, I I would say that it's pretty satisfactory because the those are the standard matching conditions that you do the, those seventy four which are called the Israel Darmua matching conditions are the usual matching conditions that that that, that are always discussed. In the, the context of matching to space times. Is this conformal matching that you are proposing compatible with this reciprocal hypothesis of matching omega to omega prime? No, there is no there is no hypothesis there. It's no, I know that there is no hypothesis, but now there is a hypothesis. And now is this matching that you are proposing uh -huh. compatible with the reciprocal hypothesis? Yeah, we haven't thought about this in, in the context of this reciprocal hypothesis. We just wanted to approach this problem from a general perspective where we have some asymptotically the sitter space time and another space time with initial isotropic singularity and just. I understand, but, but Roger will tell you that it is not what I thought about. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, uh, this is not what I wanted. That's what he says usually. Oh, I see. But if you think about it, why would you assume that this hypothesis holds? I don't know. I I don't know, but it's he somehow insists on it. I don't know. And I mean, maybe you your really maybe your proposal is compatible with this. I don't know also. I, I'm asking. Okay, so the answer is that I don't know either. Just I, we just wanted to approach this from a like geometric perspective. So the natural thing to do is to do the matching of first couple of conformal fundamental forms.